What's up, everyone, and thanks for joining us for another edition of the Prairie and Smith podcast. It's Tuesday, February 13th, and we're excited to bring you episode 181 of the show. Today is our latest conversation in our trending topic series where we've discussed some of the biggest topics affecting the Sunbelt Conference. Caden, though, before we get to today's episode, we saw the Super Bowl happen two days ago. Uh, you know, I think for me, the biggest question, most important question is, what did the pregame menu look like for Caden Smith? Uh, it, was, it was a robust menu, Noah. I got to visit my friends in Charlotte. A lot of our App State buddies and my roommates are, are in the Charlotte area, so we all got together and watched the game. And haven't really all gotten together and watched football in a while, but the, the guys took care of it. These are not the same guys I was staying with in college. I don't think their hosting skills <laughs> Bigger budgets. were as elite – I don't think there is, yeah, bigger budgets. I don't think their hosting skills are quite as robust as they are now, but we had Publix chicken tenders, all the dips you could imagine, the buffalo chicken dip, the guacamole, all kinds of stuff. We had everything kind of kind of figured out for sure. We had the meatballs. You, if you could name it, we probably had it there. And and my, my guys didn't point. I'm definitely proud of them, and the, and the game didn't disappoint forever. Uh, the game didn't disappoint as well, that's for sure. Yeah, it was a good game. I know uh, I had some of those those meatballs too. We had some uh, some pizza, some chips and dips. So it sounds like very similar menus, uh, you know, that most of us have. But yeah, Caden, I think to your point, the game did not disappoint. Uh, and how could it? You had Purdy versus Mahomes. You had Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. Can we mention that here on the Ferry and Smith podcast? And then I think the interesting thing is there were some fun Sunbelt tie-ins here too. Steve Wilkes played at App State. He's the current defensive coordinator for the 49ers. We saw Darrell Luter Jr. have a pretty costly play at one point in the game. Jarek McKinnon had a big play late. We saw Elijah Mitchell for, uh, you know, played at Louisiana, have some big carries. And again, I think the most interesting thing here was just the uh, the, the playoff rules, the change to how overtime went. And, and it sounded like the 49ers uh, didn't quite know what was going on. And that kind of shocked me a little bit. Yeah, it's crazy when you just hear the contrast of both teams talking about those rules after the games. You hear guys like Patrick Mahomes, who has been told, and the whole team for the Chiefs have been told, kind of throughout the season, the different rules, kind of having those things implanted in your head, the, the really special programs and franchises and organizations always do a great job of making sure all those little things are kind of ingrained in their players' heads. So when you get in those high pressure, high stress level situations that you can play calm and you can play freely, and that could have been the difference in the game, but you mentioned it, a ton of Sunbelt alumni in the matchup. It was great to see them. I know Elijah Mitchell. Mitchell was a guy that I did not like playing against for sure when he was at Louisiana. So great to see him get some shine. And of course, shout out to Steve Wilkes. He caught an amazing defensive game plan as good as you can, I think, especially given the first half performance we saw from that San Francisco defense. Those guys were playing inspired. They made Mahomes and the bunch look very human. But then when it gets down to that crunch time, you just kind of know and have that feeling that Mahomes and the offense with the ball in their hands kind of last is always going to get the better of teams. So I don't have that as much, as much fatigue as as other people think of the Chiefs' dominance. I really enjoy watching them still being able to do what they do, and they keep their games dramatic seemingly year after year after year, and it's just going to be interesting to see how far this dynasty can keep going moving forward with the Chiefs just doing their thing yet again. Yeah, Caden, uh, to your point, it was it was fun to watch. I know I got excited uh, when you know that Pat Mahomes is going to have a chance to lead a game-winning drive in the Super Bowl. He's come through many times before, and uh, he did it again on Sunday. So Maybe he will uh, be the future goat of, of our generation. Uh, it'll be interesting to kind of see down uh, you know, the path. But before we get to today's episode, did want to take a moment to tell you about our last episode. Kate and I uh, you know, had our second episode in our trending topic series. We spent some time talking about the transfer portal, kind of the positive and negative effects it's had on the league. And we even started a conversation that we're going to continue today. Uh, around NIL and collectives. Uh, go check it out if you haven't. Uh, definitely would suggest it. But today's show, as I mentioned, is another one in our trending topic series. Uh, today, we're going to focus on name, image, and likeness, and more familiarly known for most people as NIL. But we'll continue our discussion on the Sun Belt's positioning. We'll discuss its role in the locker room and break down how athletes can further grow their brands. But Kaden, one of the biggest things that's interesting in college football is right now NIL looks vastly different across the landscape. We, you know, on the last episode, we talked about what it looks like at Ohio State and some of the bigger schools. And now we talk more about what it looks like at the Sunbelt schools. But there is no denying that NIL is here to stay and it will be an integral part of both Sunbelt football and college football as a whole, Cato. Yeah, this is the world we live in. I think the 
only differences we're going to see as far as NIL moving forward or maybe some differences as far as the guardrails and the rules surrounding it. But as far as student athletes getting paid and being able to capitalize on their name, image and likeness, it's here and it's here fast. And you mentioned how it's different at every level. And I think that's why the Sun Belt is just in an interesting spot. You talked about Ohio State. I had to write a couple of days about on for on three that Ryan Day had a proposal to to their to their to their group of, of decision makers over there trying to pour in 12 to 13 million dollars into their NIL and you see all of the moves they're making this offseason with NIL getting multiple guys that are kind of regarded as the top guys in the country but I think when you think of it in terms of the Sun Belt level it's going to be very interesting to see which different programs are able to operate differently I think a lot of Sun Belt towns specifically are kind of the same as far as the opportunities you have but then you think of a place like Georgia State that's located in Atlanta that might have more opportunities given their proximity and where they're located or James Madison who we know kind of has a little bit more of an athletic budget than everyone else so there's a lot in between that as well and i think it's going to be very interesting to see how different sunbelt programs not just in football but across all other sports are able to capitalize and use nil to their advantage and as we know from the other topics we've talked about in this series those are going to be things that directly impact recruiting and ultimately are going to impact the products you have on the field and what you're able to do when the season comes around as far as wins and losses go yeah, and I think it's interesting, too, because it also, you know, you mentioned the unique positioning in a lot of these small college towns. I do think there are some unique opportunities for a, a Boone, North Carolina, a Harrisonburg, Virginia, a, a Mobile, Alabama to, you know, some of these local businesses to partner with these athletes in ways that they weren't able to in the future. And I think that that could be huge for those communities. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting when you talk about NIL, when you have the, the national kind of landscape and the conversation about NIL, when you turn on ESPN on any, any given day and you're hearing people discuss how NIL is different, the same and just the different nuances of it. That, that's a completely different level of NIL when you're talking about the big name athletes, the guys who have the names that are going to get drafted and selected in April at those big time schools, the Caleb Williams in the world and others that you see in State Farm commercials like, like Caitlin Clark or a Dr. Pepper commercial like you've seen Dr. Caleb Williams. It's completely different for the Sumbo. And I think when you look at these student athletes, they're just looking for a little bit more money in their pocket, a meal paid for, just little things that can go a long way. And some of these kids will be able to see kind of big money and big dollars because of these collectives. And some of that can be used for a lot of different ways as far as being able to give that back, given to your home situation, being able to save that for your future when your playing career is over. So I think overall NIL is not created equally, but I think when it comes down to the Sun Belt level and really other group of five levels, it's just a, a, a different landscape and a different kind of stratosphere as compared to some of the other stuff. And I still think in that there's just a different level of charm. And I think it's just, it's more down to earth. It's not gonna be the, the, necessarily the same kind of NIL we're talking about as far as the biggest programs that produce the most money that are going to ultimately end up producing the most talent as a result as well. Yeah, I think that's so fascinating. And I mean, we'll talk a little bit more towards the end of this episode about building your brand as an athlete, but you, you know, you look at deals like you, you think of, you know, Ryan Berger and the, 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 the burger that he had at the Cardinal and Boone and uh, even Davis Brin and Caleb Hood, some of the deals that they struck with uh, some local produce companies. And there's other examples in the Sun Belt. Uh, unique ways for some of these local businesses to tie in and further work with these athletes. And I think that that is a, a very interesting space here at the Sunbelt level that will continue to be exploited into the future. But Cannon, I think one of the more interesting aspects of NIL is in the locker room. And, and I don't have a lot of experience. I, I've heard hyperbole. I've heard you talk about it in the past. I, I even know that there was an article that you wrote for Sportico that has been referenced on this podcast back in the day about the inner workings of that. I, I mean, you think of maybe in your example, guys like a Chase Bryce who who could be making more NIL than a Caden Smith, given uh, his stature as a starting quarterback. What was your experience in the locker room as NIL first started to, to come about? And, and did it ever build a level of division or animosity in the locker room? Or, or did that make you guys uh, better as a football team? Yeah, it's interesting. I think my perspective is a little unique, too, just because I was there for the beginning of NIL. You could call our class or our senior class kind of the pioneers of it just because we were the first ones trying to navigate through the space. And just between now and then, it's come such a long way. So I can only speak from my experience to when NIL wasn't nearly as relevant as it is now. But at the time, it wasn't hardly talked about in the locker room. And when it was talked about, it was never a negative thing. I know early on when we were talking about just the discussion surrounding paying college athletes before it became a thing, in July a couple of years ago, it was a big kind of the talking point to talk about how it could potentially create division in a locker room. And that's 
think just being an athlete, that's just further from the truth. When you talk about the relationship you have with your teammates, especially in a sport like football, you're going through the hardest times with people that are coming in at the same time as you. You're going through so much on the field, off the field. You're spending so much time with each other that it's a brotherhood. It's not the kind of situation to where you'd be mad if someone you work with got a promotion or any other situation in the real world, a really good friend of yours or a sibling were making more money than you in a certain situation. Everyone kind of understands the NIL line, landscape. And as you mentioned it before, you talk about a guy like Ryan Berger, who's not in the conference anymore. He gets an opportunity because of his last name alone. And when you talk about the different opportunities you can have with NIL, it doesn't always necessarily have to relate or translate to playing time. The starting quarterback at any school is probably going to have very lucrative and op a ton of opportunities to, to capitalize on their NIL maybe more than other players. But with social media these days and the different talents that people bring to the table, there's a lot of different lanes and ways to use your name, image, and likeness to uplift yourself and get yourself some dollars. I mean, there's going to be high school recruits that come in with a vast and large social media following. Maybe maybe they have a, a Twitch stream or something. There's different revenues, uh, revenue streams for these student athletes to, to capitalize on. Maybe they're from certain areas where they can tap in with different NIL markets back home if they're from a different area than someone else. And you think about it across all of sports, even women's sports, they're going to have the opportunities as well to create more dollars than, say, male sports. So it kind of evens the playing field overall. And I think every college student athlete knows that the opportunities out there for them, if they want to capitalize on their dollars, ultimately, you're going to get the most dollars, the better you compete at your sport and the highest level you compete out of that. So everyone understands that. I think within the locker room, it's never going to be an issue between players on the same team having any kind of beef or drama because of NIL stuff, because everyone kind of knows if you play the best and you're on the field, you'll have the best opportunities. And even if you don't, you can make, make your own lane and make your own way as well when it comes to the NIL marketplace. Yeah, I think those are some interesting perspectives. And to further that point, uh, I mean, the least that maybe some of your teammates who are making a little bit more coin uh, could do is maybe pick up the dinner check every once in a while. Did that ever happen? <laughs> Not quite. I know when I was getting in the early stages of NIL, you got to think I was I've been doing this forever. I had a podcast in college and I was just trying to get somebody to sponsor our podcast. And I got that. And that was a cost that I didn't have to take care of. So that was that was enough for me. You get a deal with a local restaurant. You're not buying dinner for a night or you can hook up your boys. Maybe if you have a deal somewhere else, we had a lot of guys that had clean eats going. So trying to maybe help each other get deals as well. It was way more of a, a communal thing where you wanted to see everyone win in that space versus competition. But yes, I'm sure these days you probably have a lot more quarterbacks who were already treating their offensive linemen in the past. I know we talked about Chase Bryce taking care of his guys up front. The stakes of that probably get higher and higher as you're a guy who maybe makes a little bit more coin than others. So I think it's definitely that, that kind of thing for sure happens, even though it might not be something that I saw happen as much when I was playing. Yeah, definitely uh, fascinating dynamics, and you really were there during kind of the early stages of NIL. It'll be interesting to see, you know, as we move forward, just some of the stories uh, that come out of these locker rooms. But, Caden, I think that brings us to an interesting point about NIL, and for athletes, it, it comes down to building your brands. And and you mentioned the, the number of ways that can be done. It can be done as simple as having a, a last name, uh, a burger, and then that leads to uh, you know, a deal with a restaurant. There are other ways, like you said, with with Twitch and now social media and how you're utilizing that. And uh, I think that's the fascinating aspect of this that maybe Sunbelt athletes, uh, you know, can really get into. I mean, we've even seen, uh, I think, back to women's basketball in the Sunbelt, uh, a girl by the name of Casey Ferguson at South Alabama, she started doing cooking videos uh, on TikTok. And next thing you know, had 2 million followers. She was one of the top 10 most followed athletes. So I think those are, you know, things that athletes can do to begin developing their brands. And then another important element of that is networking and building relationships. And I think that's a major element uh, of collectives and being able to connect you with businesses, because at the end of the day, yes, I think some of these athletes want to make some money during college and help pay for some of their expenses. But ultimately, a lot of these athletes are not going pro and they want to set themselves up better for life. And I think NIL presents uh, the ability to do some networking and further build your brand that only helps you uh, in the future. Yeah, you're not going to hear as many of these stories as much, but anyone who's familiar with the space or has talked to college athletes about NIL, they'll tell you about how much of a, a great tool it is for them to kind of prepare them for the real world. You mentioned that most athletes are not going to go professional. Everyone kind of knows that reality. It's the unspoken thing that you talk about and you know when you're in your college career and the better you can set yourself up for that future, the better off you'll be. And there's a financial way to do that, as we've mentioned. If you're stacking up NIL money and you're using it right and saving it right, you could definitely help yourself when you're making that transition from being an athlete to going into the working world. But I think a step further than that is a lot of these 
NIL collectives and a lot of these opportunities that athletes are creating for themselves and schools are creating for them kind of mutually are just giving them different financial advice. They're giving them different connections, like you mentioned. I think there's so many more benefits than that are getting the surface scratch as far as the, the kind of overall narrative of NIL. And when you talk about just the marketplace as a whole, when you look at sports, as, as, a, as a collective and how much money it makes. It's only right the student athletes not only are able to reap the benefits financially, but maybe also reap the benefits as far as being at a school with cache with an alumni base and being able to kind of prepare yourself and have conversations and get into rooms that you might not necessarily see yourself in or have been have seen yourself in with prior student athletes in the NIL space. So I think we're going to always hear about the the fun deals. That's what's going to grab the headlines which you're going to see on, on social media when you see these cool vid videos and releases. But I think the people shaking hands with some of these different donors and kind of setting themselves up for the future and creating opportunities for, for themselves beyond sports. I think when we get further and further away from NIL, we'll hear more student athletes and former student athletes that are in the real working world saying, hey, this is how much NIL helped me. This is how this made me the person I am today and set me up for the future. You've even seen things like student athletes being able to pay for their siblings tuition and stuff. I just think from a financial aspect and just the game, you can get in the way you can prepare yourself for the next level and even having to manage deals and learn about some of the nuances with personal finance and having maybe more money than you're usually accustomed to making at that age and preparing yourself for the future to use it smartly as well is just one of the few benefits you'll see with NIL, I think, moving forward as we continue to evolve with it. Well, and I think you bring up an interesting point there that, again, I'm starting to hear more and more around the Sunbelt Conference specifically, and and that's NIL education, because at this point, you know, like it or not, the schools cannot be involved in, in these deals. Uh, you know, I don't know if fans necessarily believe that's not happening already, but uh, at least that's what the rules say. That's what the NCAA is trying to enforce at this point. But um, NIL education, I think, is huge. I mean, I've had conversations with you know, the James Madisons, the App States, Louisiana's, the Georgia Southerns, and, and a number of other schools in the Sun Belt. And they have chosen to take the approach of how can we educate these athletes on, you know, what are they signing in terms of the contract? What does that mean? What does that entail? And then take it a step further. What contract should you not be signing? What contract should you be signing? Because we also have seen in this space where future earnings can potentially be, you know, pulled from based on, you know, some of the deals that are being signed. So I think it's not as big of a deal at the Sun Belt level because of probably some of the monetary values of some of these deals that are being signed. But NIL education is an important step that I think a lot of these Sun Belt schools should be paying attention to so that their athletes are not being taken advantage of. Yeah, and that's a, just another good part about the Sun Belt being in the position they're at in the markets place or all these schools want to want to build build and bolster up their collectives as much as they can so they can give their student athletes ultimately the best deals and the most money to attend their schools of course but while we're not in that place quite yet it's a great opportunity to kind of learn this space a little bit more we've talked about how nil and the transfer portal at large are kind of the wild wild west right now as all of these coaches and programs try to figure things out but i think when you're in in the conference like the Sun Belt, there's a little bit more leeway, like you mentioned, to kind of figure things out, get guidance, and just, I'm not going to say more honesty than you'd get from a higher level school, but you just know how the dealings are at these high levels when that price goes up compared to a Sun Belt level where things are going to be a little bit more cut and dry, and you're not going to probably hear as many of these horror stories or potential horror stories about kids maybe getting misguided, being done wrong by an agent and just all these little things that kind of happen in business at large that could happen in a smaller scale in the NIL marketplace, just given how new it is and how everyone's kind of learning on the fly right now. So I think the Sun Belt, as we mentioned before, now is in a great place to kind of learn from their, themselves, learn from each other, and for these student athletes to learn how to properly navigate through this space. And all that experience, experience is ultimately going to help them, I think, in the future as well, like we talked about before. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a very well rounded education at that point. Not only are you getting the the athletic uh, acumen from playing on the field, you're getting the academic component to this. I know you graduated with two degrees in your time uh, at App State, and then potentially continuing to get that financial literacy and those you know that information that can only help you uh, throughout the rest of your life. So I think those are some great uh, aspects of NIL. Obviously, you and I are, are pro name, image, and likeness. I think we want to. Uh, continue to see opportunities uh, developed for student athletes. I know I'm personally excited about EA Sports College Football and some of the money that college athletes are going to get uh, to be a part of that. So there's a lot of interesting elements in this space. And I know you and I are excited to further unpack this as we get into the offseason. We've got a series coming up uh, in May that's going to be, uh, I think, uh, some really informative conversations with collective heads, agents, athletic directors, coaches, athletes about 
uh, the NIL space. So that'll definitely be something uh, to keep your eye on as we move throughout the remainder of the offseason. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode. We hope you all enjoyed the show. Don't forget, we're coming back on Thursday. We're going to be continuing our trending topic series, this time discussing the the schedule in college football and, and how that affects the Sunbelt Conference. Uh, it really has become uh, a year-round game at this point. So make sure you join us uh, for that episode on Thursday. That'll do it for us here at the Prairie and Smith Podcast. Before you go, leave us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. Drop us a comment here on YouTube. Tell us what you like about the show. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So for Caden Smith, Richmond Weaver, and Brett Jemis, I'm Noah Freire. Thanks for spending more time with us today. Well, that's goodbye for now. We'll talk to you again on Thursday. Thank you.